Hello, everyone, and welcome to Listen Able. It's Angus O'Loughlin here, of course, one half of the show. Dylan Alcott is not here. Uh, he couldn't make it today for this recording, but uh, I'm going to be holding this one solo. We are chatting to an incredible fashionista. What did she call A fashion girly. Um, you might have seen her on Instagram. She's got over 125,000 followers, and she really breaks down not only the fashion industry in New York, um, but also her own stigmas around her disability growing up and how she's disability proud today. It's an incredible interview. I hope you really enjoy it, and let's meet April Lockhart. Hey guys, I'm April Lockhart, content creator focused on also normalizing disabilities. I was born with a limb difference, amniotic band syndrome, so my left hand is not was born not fully formed. Um, yeah, I have a business background working in the beauty industry and influencer marketing, have recently transitioned to full-time creator life. Um, I guess that's my intro. Yeah, the amazing intro as well. I also just love Americans because you do introductions so perfectly in Australian Australians are like ah oh, I'm just I'm Tom uh, and we're just like, we have to push it out of people so thank you very much for the great introduction um, for people who uh, you know might have might not be following you um, April Lockhart um, on Instagram and April underscore Lockhart on TikTok huge following so far uh, and like you said mostly based off fashion and beauty um, my first question to you just in because it was part of your intro was so you worked in the industry working with you know, influences on campaigns. W was it just the fact you went, these guys aren't doing that great of a job and I could do better that you decided to make the transition? I'd always shared content online. It was not focused on my disability at all. So very different, just always interested in fashion um, and actually very opposite of what I'm sharing now. Not opposite, but, um, you know, average fashion content. I was working in the beauty industry, working with influencers. And genuinely, I never thought I'll do this. Like, it's interesting knowing the business side, knowing people are like, surely you saw how much money influencers are making, right? And you're like, I should do this myself. And I was like, no, like, yes, I was like, wow, people are making a lot of money, but the money was not coming to me uh, until it was. Um, and I feel like things happen really quickly. So I was sharing fashion content, very much hiding my disability, um, just keeping up with the Joneses, you know, like, and I think I've talked about this a little bit before, but it's almost like a snowball effect when you're like hiding your disability, which for me, it can be like long sleeves, just like this, you know, walking around, people don't notice it, they don't really like give you a second look. Um, and the more you don't talk about it, it becomes like increasingly awkward and hard to talk about. So hmm a picture of my limb difference has not been online in like two years. So now to show something, people are going to be like, wait, what? And so many people who I was like internet friends with didn't even know I had a disability. So um, in 2022, I kind of like made this jump. I started the series called Normalizing Disabled Fashion Girlies um, and just started sharing outfits every day, really focused on like quirks of like how I button my shirts or tie my, you know, tie my shoelaces or button jeans, whatever, like things that were like, didn't come natural to me. Um, and that's sort of where my channel really started to grow. And that kind of just came from like, internal self work of like, what, why, what am I sharing? I'm like, offering nothing to the world. I'm just like, trying to be like everybody else. And I'm very much like everything happens for a reason, you know, I very much felt like a good responsibility to share uh, about my disability and just be more vulnerable. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this. And then it's kind of spiraled to now. Well, there's two, I've got so many questions from that alone. Firstly, you know, not showing your disability, were you actively trying to hide your disability or was just the fact that, yeah, you have limb difference, but you know, it's not as if you're, you, you, um, you know, you have got an arm amputation from the shoulder where you have a loose sleeve that, you know, your arm does go down to near your wrist. So were you actively hiding it for the reasons that you spoke about? Or was it just that you didn't feel that it was something you needed to bring up in conversation? I think I was actively hiding it to a certain degree. I've talked about like, I feel like recently I've started to realize, you know, and I think other people with disability can probably relate, like every new season of life, it's like you're meeting new people and you're having to deal with your insecurity all over again. You're like, will they accept me? Then once I felt safe with people, this was like every phase of life, you know, starting college, starting new jobs, like just meeting, dating, meeting new people in general. It's like, will they accept me? 
do I feel safe? Okay, now I feel safe. Now I'll show them my hand or or my insecurity. So I felt like I would actively hide it. And for so then social media is like the biggest thing, right? Where I'm constantly sharing. And so I never really, at least for like a few years, which was really like college timing, college and like early career, like I hadn't shown my arm in probably two years. So it felt like at that point, now I'm like actively hiding it, right? Like mm. it's, it feels like if I show a picture where you can really see it, like now I have to talk about it. And so it may have started out like, okay, it might have started out like I'm not intentionally hiding it. And then it became like, okay, well, I haven't talked about it in so long. So now it's going to be really uncomfortable for people who didn't realize. It's it's no different to like, being introduced to somebody, seeing them a week later and forgetting their name, and then you've gone so long without learning that person's name that they just become, in Australia, g'day mate, instead of g'day Tom or g'day Jess. And so it might be at that point that people just like, uh, just like it's a bit awkward to even bring, bring up the topic, I guess. Right, exactly. Do you think now, you know, uh, going back to that story, like, being, you know, disability proud is something that Dylan loves to speak about. He's so proud about being, you know, um, his life in the chair since he was born and his life is so great because of him, his disability. He's had so many chances. Do you think that you saw a transition in your life, obviously your work from sort of what you've spoken about, but by sort of coming to, I don't know, accepting exactly who you are and loving your disability as a part of who you are? For sure. And I think... I also have gotten so many amazing opportunities out of this. And and I've gone through different phases in life. I haven't always hid my arm up until the last few years. Like I did music as a teenager and played guitar with a prosthetic. And that was very much like present. And you could see I was playing guitar with one hand. So that was like a different season of life where maybe I was really comfortable. Then, you know, started college and early career, kind of went back into the like insecurity hole. And I think you can have like these constant resets Um, but for sure now it's such a big part of my platform and has made me so much more comfortable as a person. And, you know, I'm sure like Dylan can, can attest to like, it comes with like a really nice weight and responsibility and also so much opportunity that I would have never had before. So I think it's like really only positive. Using, uh, fashion terms here, um, would you yeah. say that your disability or your limb difference is your greatest accessory? It is my greatest accessory now. Mm-hmm. I just think it's amazing that, you know, you are, your content is so proud about your disability, but the focus is the fashion. That's what I really like about this because a lot of disability advocates um, advocate for the disability from the outset, whereas yours are more subtle identity of, um, hi, I'm April Lockhart and I'm into fashion beauty. Um and but yeah, here's my limb difference. It's really cool. It's like a different edge to what we usually speak to. Fashion first, mm. like, or or they're they're sort of like neck and neck, I guess now. Um, but for me, it's always been talking about my disability through the lens of fashion and beauty. Like, I I don't know that. I mean, who knows what the future holds? But I never intended for my platform to be like solely focused on disability advocacy. Mm. I think. The fashion and beauty space needs so much work. (laughs) And, you know, I've started to see so many other disabled creators in the fashion space. And I don't know if it's just, you know, now that's my algorithm or if they've Mm. always been there. But I like to think like more people, more creators in the disabled community are starting to find each other, feel more comfortable. And, you know, it's like, what does my disability have to do with the fact that I love fashion? I went to fashion school. Like, at the end of the day, like I will always be a fashion girl um, who happens to have a disability. And I I think about that with adaptive fashion too, because so many people obviously are like, oh, you have a limb difference. Like, you know, what are your favorite adaptive fashion brands and stuff like that? And I'm like, to be quite honest, there's not a lot of adaptive fashion brands that I would actually wear. Like styles just aren't cool. And I will always choose at the end of the day. I will force my friends to tie things for me. I'll force my husband to button or tie things for me if it's like a good outfit over um you know it being adaptive or functional um and so you know I think the adaptive space has a lot a lot of ways to go to like 
it has to keep up with fashion, right? If you care about fashion, it has to like look good at the end of the day. So, I mean, you're in the you know, fashion districts of New York. Um, you, you're not seeing somebody who's standing up in the adaptive space and going, um, we're going to build on fashion first and accessibility second, but make it accessible for all. You're not really seeing that through your work? Not really. I've seen, you know, a couple like big brands, fashion brands drop like adaptive capsules. For example, Mm. this uh, past fall, I walked in a show for Victoria's Secret that was like their first adaptive capsule collection um, for like bras and underwear, which was very cool. And I think like those brands are working on it, but I'm not super familiar with a ton of adaptive brands themselves. Um, Fill this space, April. Get in there. I know. Yeah. Should I create my own? There's a market there. Here first. I know. Twenty five percent of the world with disability. Um, let's talk about heritage brands then. I'm not going to name them, but we sort of know who they are. They're sort of large brands, very nice handbags, um, and of course other clothing options. Do you find that they are more reluctant, being a bit archaic towards moving towards accessibility inclusion? Because obviously. I feel, and this is just my personal belief, that when I see a campaign, you know, I think we all know or or feel up until like, let's call it like 2018 or 2019, we were still seeing the same representation in models. And then all of a sudden, maybe some difference in race was included for inclusion. And I felt like these brands were being forced by maybe a younger marketing team coming through going, we need to be more inclusive as a brand. We don't, we can't just be pushing the same um, image onto people. So race obviously being something that has been more inclusive, size is now being uh, included in inclusivity. But is disability the same? I mean, yes, we've talked about Victoria's Secret. I remember seeing that model show, having chairs yourself um, on the walkway of something um, would have been an incredible opportunity. But are we seeing these big brands and heritage brands make these moves? And do you feel that it's more genuine inclusion or if it's just trying to look inclusive because that's where, you know, the younger market wants to see? I feel like it's the next movement and I've felt that way for the last like year or so. Exactly what you're saying. I've said this in different interviews and stuff like, you know, race and color inclusion, size inclusion. And I think the next wave is sort of disability inclusion. First in marketing, second in like functionality and product. Mm. You know, I think marketing is an easier uh, place to start. I think brands are open to it. Sometimes I think they just, I don't even think it's ill intent. I think they just don't know how to approach it. And I always encourage brands just like have conversations with people like, you know, curate the right group of people because I'm never someone who's going to come into a brand boardroom and be like, this is everything you're doing wrong. It's like, I'm not an expert. You can ask me questions. Like, let's work on it together. If you want to actually work on it, like you're doing the steps you need to do. So like, it's only a positive conversation. So I think it's like curating the right group of people who actually want to make change. But Sometimes I think the brands just don't – like, they're scared they're going to say something wrong, so Mm. they might not even start, you know? Um, So I'm like, you know, any steps are better than no steps. So, you know, if brands are listening, like, just curate a group of disabled creators. You know, if they're not your models, even, like, have conversations with them behind the scenes. Pay them for the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, just get feedback. Hey, what can we do better? Like, we really don't know. Like, admitting you don't know – best thing in the world. Like Mm. no one's going to be mad at you for that. Like we don't know what to do. How can we improve our um, marketing campaigns? Like, do you guys have anyone you recommend to cast? Um, You know, and in influencer marketing campaigns too, even if it's not like big model campaigns, how can you make sure you're a mix of your influencer marketing campaigns include disabled creators? Mm. Talking about New York Fashion Week, you actually created your own event. Can you tell everyone about that? And uh, at its core, it was around disability and the group of people that were there. All of a sudden, you're in a room where a majority of people are um, in the fashion industry with disability. What was that like? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I have a mixed relationship with Fashion Week in general. I've only been a couple times, but... um, you know, it's a week that can feel super exclusive. By nature, you're not going to be invited to everything. That's okay. Even if you're an able-bodied person, like doesn't matter who you are, you're not going to be invited to everything at Fashion Week. So by nature, it's already like feeling very clicky. You can go in and just feel really intimidated. 
and the rooms you're in, it's, you know, everybody's super cool. You're like, I think everyone in the room feels out of place, even mm. if they don't act like it. Um, so, you know, it's sort of one of those things where you want to and have to be there for work, but also you never really leave feeling good. Mm. Um, and I wanted to go this year and also just look forward to something that was my own. I wanted to sort of let go of like feeling the need to be invited to everything or being worried what I wasn't invited to or being excluded from and create the space for women with disabilities, creators that loved fashion, um, a lot of which also were part of um, the Victoria's Secret show with me and kept it really intimate. We rented out a photo studio, you know, had all the girls bring their own looks that they just like wanted to wear. It wasn't tied to a brand. There were no responsibilities or deliverables. Um, it was just like, come take photos for yourself. Um, and so we had just like a tiny group, 12 girls in the space. And um, it was really special to be exactly like the majority in a room instead of the minority. Um, and hopefully there's lots more of that to come. I want to do some other like major cities and, and, just start to like host these events in general, dinners and, um, you know, brand events and creating these opportunities within fashion and beauty specifically for disabled creators. Having that one-on-one -on -one experience with, you know, I'm sure you have one-on-one -on -one experiences with people with disability in the same industry as you um, often, but, you know, obviously having that event, do you find in your work of sort of accidentally advocating um, through your socials that it's, you know, it's easy to kind of break down that stigma around disability with you in particular by doing Instagram posts where you're hitting a majority of people, or do you think that you can have a more profound impact by having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and sort of breaking that down? I mean, the one-on-one -on -one conversations are always more impactful, but I think that content and, and reaching the masses is you know, it, it offers a different opportunity and, and I can't have a conversation with everyone one-on-one. -on -one. I wish I could, mm. but, um, you know, it, it's two different things, I think. And I want to continue to, you know, it's like beginner level on Instagram, like just introduce people, start to normalize, like, and then, you know, at these events go a bit deeper with people, but also, you know, the events are more for just like celebrating, connecting community, like feeling really off. Um, especially within fashion and beauty because I think it's like majority of my job I'm in I'm at events and I'm the only disabled woman in the room at fashion events beauty events that's okay I don't think anybody looks at me weird um and I don't I don't feel particularly like oh wow this is obvious um you know I'm happy to be in the room but I think something feels so like fulfilling and just relaxing to be in a room where, you know, not everybody looks like me, but we're all different in our own way. Mm. Um, and it feels very like, you're like, okay, I'm off. Like, whereas I feel like in a lot of events, you have to be on. Um, I feel like with each other, like, even though our disabilities are all different, um, you can feel that, like, you just have that common denominator of like, you know, we're all used to being the odd one out in a room. Usually we start at the start of somebody's life, but, you know, I love that we started with how we got to know April Lockhart. But can we go back to um, yourself as a child, you know, born with limb difference, um, you've known a life with it, not without one. You know, it's, we, we speak to people who are amputees. Um, and so obviously mm -hmm. they would have some experiences able-bodied and then transition, which is a totally different story to you. There's a moment in your very early schooling that kind of was at least reads transformative for you. Can you tell people that experience? Yeah. So I was in a classroom when I was maybe four and, you know, my parents, what else did they know? Any parents with mm -hmm. kids with disabilities, they gave me prosthetics and brought me to doctors that would create prosthetics for me as a kid. Um and, oh, God, I hated prosthetics. Like, always, they were so heavy and sweaty. And I I took my prosthetic. I was in a room of kids that were probably, like, preschool age and flung it across the room just because it was getting, like, heavy and sweaty. And I was just like, oh, you know. And the kids were like, 
<laughs> jaw dropped like what yeah. like because we're all kids they didn't even think about like this hand isn't real like that didn't process for them <laughs> yeah and i really never wore prosthetics since i had tried a few like you know i would try different phases of ones and i think my parents were doing their due diligence of like are you sure you don't want this like could it be helpful um and eventually you know i just have learned to live without it but yeah, I do think I look back on that and say like, wow, that was maybe like symbolic for my life and in different seasons of even two years ago, deciding to stop hiding my limb difference and start being really vocal on social media about my disability. Um, it's kind of like ripping that bandage off or ripping that prosthetic off. Hmm. So that was um, when you were four years old. You know, we do, you know, not everyone, because there might be teens listening to this, but there is this time when you're a teenager and bodies are changing, our perceptions of ourselves are changing, all of the imagery that we see, you know, back when, you know, we were kids were quite different. Like we said, hopefully my daughter who's growing up is going to see a lot more inclusion. But did you ever go back through a phase of hiding your disability away? Like at that point, you don't you didn't know that there was probably a difference, but did you go into a point of hiding it? Did you try and do prosthetics again when you were in your teens? Um, what was that process going through those really formative years? Yeah, I didn't get prosthetics again, but I definitely would hide my disability. I I went through schooling like I went to a private school where basically it was like the same people since like second grade to like I left as like a sophomore. So. I will say I got like comfortable with the same group of people that probably knew me from a really young age and kind of grew with me. But of course, it's school and there's constantly new kids coming in. And so it kind of like sort of consistently resets that insecurity of like, oh, there's new people now. They have to understand that I'm different. Um, so yes, I would hide it to a certain degree. I'm grateful that I was with a lot of people that grew with me and had at least friends that knew me and and I wasn't feeling super isolated but dating was really weird like teen dating awful you know it's like unless these unless a guy like really knew me I felt like ooh this is like probably unattractive and I do think like you know teens can be really immature really surface level like they sometimes do care about that stuff which it's not the right person if they do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so that was like a constant reset of insecurities. I remember like, you know, at maybe 14 or something, one of the first guys I liked, like we would hang out outside of school and then in school he would like pretend not to know me or pretend that we weren't hanging out mm. at, outside of school. Um, and I would think back on that and be like, we were dating, you know, like we were seeing each other. Um, and... Then I found out, you know, he was embarrassed about my hand. And I was like, oh, as a 14-year-old, that's like really yeah. a tough hit to the ego. Um, but then it's like you move on. You find different people. But it was definitely hard. You're married uh, and your husband, there's something around his not knowing about your disability for a little bit. Was that deliberate <laughs> or was that just because he was so infatuated with you as a person, as a whole? The, ni the night I met my husband, we were like, me and my husband have been inseparable since the day we met, basically. Um, so this isn't a traditional, like, meet cute. Um, we kissed hours into meeting. Wouldn't, you know, not to say that's the right way, but. Um, hey, work for you. And <laughs> it happens, you know, uh, early 20s. And, you know, I had, I was wearing a long denim jacket. I remember I was coming from somebody's graduation party. I think I was 22. And. I, we were like instantly connected. Maybe we were love at first sight. Who knows? But um, I just continued to hide my arm. Wasn't really talking about it. I mean, this is hours in. Later, he goes to like grab me, like to grab my hand or something. And he was like, oh, what happened to your hand? <laughs> and I was like frozen. Um, I was like, I was born that way. And just totally turning red. And he was like, oh, that's cool. And just didn't really say anything about it. You know, later on, I asked him like, how, what what were you thinking? And he was like, I was also frozen, didn't know what to say, but like I wanted to make you comfortable and also was just like, you know, and in the following weeks, I really didn't talk about it much. Um, I think it took me like us being really comfortable with each other for me to start opening up of like, hey, this is why I didn't, I think I was in an insecure period of life, like another reset period. I was entering a new job and 
obviously meeting him, meeting new friends. Um, and so he, he, I think when we were finally comfortable, he asked me like, Hey, why don't you talk about your arm or why don't you wear short sleeves? Like, do you, I, I just want you to know, like you can feel comfortable and I don't want you to feel like you have to hide that. Um, but obviously do whatever makes you like, he was really just like, I want you to be comfortable. And, and he, I recently asked him about it cause I've been kind of doing these like vulnerable voiceovers to some styling videos lately. Um, and I was like, what did you think about that? And he was like, he started crying and he was like, I was just sad. Like it made me so sad that you felt like you couldn't be comfortable in front of me or other people. Um, so I married the right guy, yeah. but um, it's, like a keeper. it's like finding that right person. Dating with a disability can be really messy and hard and uh, emotional. So it's like finding the right person that empowers you and, you know, doesn't have any of those subtle uh, weird things. Um, April, thank you so much for this. We finish uh, with a bowl of uncomfortable. The bowl of uncomfortable is a question sent in by a listener or a viewer of our Instagram or our YouTube. And it's a question knowing that you're going to be on our podcast in the future that they have maybe specifically to you, maybe specific to uh, your limb difference, or maybe it's just a general disability question that we've got. This is one of the great questions. And uh, Ben, shout outs to you, my man. Uh, He's a regular commenter on our Instagram, Listenable, and he has uh, cerebral palsy himself. Great question, Benno. April, do you pay half price for a manicure? I do pay half price for a manicure. I didn't know I didn't know until I asked because so many people have asked me this and I was like, you know what? I'm going in and I'm asking the lady. So she said yes. Brilliant. Had you been paying full price before you asked? No, but I just didn't know I was getting a discount. Oh, right. And I'm like, I tell my friends, like, actually, this place is super cheap. Like, <laughs> you should check them out. <laughs> and they and they're like, there, what? Like, this is 60 bucks. What are you talking about? 60? It's 30. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this place is great. Oh, that's genius. <laughs> oh, gosh. April Lockhart. It is at April Lockhart. Of course, we're going to be sharing all this across our Insta, so make sure you give April a follow. It's on TikTok, though. Couldn't get the same handle. Who's the other April Lockhart who's taken it? I don't know, but I tried to DM her. Sell it back to me if you if you hear this. Most frustrating thing about this is when they don't post and they haven't posted in like five, six years. It's like, I, know. I think there should be an Instagram slash TikTok slash whatever rule. If someone's inactive on an account, put it back into the community. Yep. Anyway, that's my thoughts. April underscore Lockhart on the TikTok. All the links are below. Thank you so much um, for teaching me about, you know, the fashion industry uh, and a little bit about your experience within it from a different country in a different lens. It's been um, really great. Yeah. So thank you. This was a blast. Thank you for having me.